If you know someone you feel might benefit from that, we ask you to do that. Turn to the person next to you, smile and say, you are the best looking thing I've seen all day. So glad you're here, looking forward to what God has. Tonight, I want to build on last night. If you weren't here Sunday morning, uh, the Lord helped us on the message of believe, I believe, now help my unbelief. And we were dealing with how God speaks to us in our valleys, how God speaks to us even in our doubts, that we have a God that is not unfamiliar with our infirmities, that when we hurt, he hurts, when we cry, he cries, and he understands us. Sunday night, we dealt with thanking God in advance, not being a beggar, but being a believer. And there's a difference that we don't have to repeat our prayers over to God over and over and over again. I told you I know a lot of great people that will come to the altars and they pray the same thing over and over and over again. Oh, God, can you bring me the healing? Oh, God, can you help my family? And understand that he heard you the first time. And that possibly the reason you're not getting an answer when you want it in the appointed time, God is working it out. So instead of begging him, you believe his word and you turn your begging into praising. You turn your doubts into praise. If you believe that, someone say amen. And then we went to, on Monday night, encouraging yourself in the Lord, that as long as I have a praise in my mouth, that I am not defeated. And I shared with you that in 28 years of ministry, I have found out that as long as we do have a praise in our mouth, then we are not defeated. And God calls us to encourage ourselves. And then last night, from there, we went to, are you ready and really willing to experience God's will in your life? We talked about a young lady by the name of Ruth who came out of a background of bondage and hurt and pain. She was a Moabitess. Her family was cursed literally because of all of the things that they allowed to happen through the generations. At one time blessed the son or the nephew of of Abraham, but Lot was the progenitor of that family. And because of the things that happened in his life, well, they came under a curse. And yet she made a decision hinged upon the love of a mother-in-law that brought her to the saving knowledge of God. We talked about how we can intercede and we can be the hinge upon which we could point someone to Bethlehem of Judea. In other words, the word Bethlehem means house of bread. Judea means praise, but when you put them together, it's the house of bread and fertile praise. And God is calling us to point our loved ones back to the house of God with fertile praise. Tonight, I want to put a capstone upon that and speak to you on the topic, Jesus came to earth because he knew heaven was waiting for us. Jesus came to earth because he knew heaven was waiting for us. And when you have a desire and a call of God on your life to see your loved ones saved, I believe what really helps you to not give in and give up is to continually keep your eyes on the shorelines of heaven. Look with me now to Luke 19, starting verse 37 through 44. Turn your Bible on or follow on the screen. And if you're watching by live stream, we want to welcome you wherever you are across the area. If you're here in South Carolina or possibly watching in another part of the country, uh, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Luke 19, 37 through 44. As he was drawing near, speaking of Jesus. Already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. And they were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. I want you to pay very close attention to verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. It wasn't a shedding of a tear. To weep is a deep grief. He wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. In 1952, a woman by the name of Florence Chadwick, she decided to swim the English Channel. She decided that after that victory, she was going to do something even greater. 
She wanted to swim 22 miles from Santa Catalina Island in Southern California to the beaches of Los Angeles, California. And she trained and trained and trained. Well, a day came and she dove into the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, at Santa Catalina, and she began to swim that 22 miles. She swam for 15 long hours, giving it everything she had trying to make it to the beaches there of Southern California. Finally, exhaustion overcame her, and the support boat pulled her from the water. Later that day, at her press conference, she said this. She said, I believe I could have made it if I just could have seen the shoreline. I believe I could have made it if I just could have seen the shoreline. What she didn't know and found out later was she gave up And when she gave up, they pulled her from the water. She was just a few hundred yards short of the beach, just a couple hundred yards from her goal. And the reason she didn't realize it, the fog was so dense that day, she lost heart and gave in to her exhaustion and her discouragement. Hear her words again. If I could have seen the shoreline, I know I could have made it. And again, the environment all around her was fog, and she lost heart, and she gave in. I begin with that story because I believe there's a tremendous truth in those words for each one of us who are here who call ourselves the children of God. For the believer, the shoreline is heaven. For the believer, the shore is Jesus. He is the destination. Jesus is the place. You cannot have heaven without Jesus. They are not a mixed package. You can't have one without the other. They are not interchangeable. Jesus, in his short time here on earth, he never took his eyes off the shorelines of heaven. He knew exactly why he came, and he allowed nothing in this life to begin to cause him to keep his eyes away from it. It began in Luke chapter 2. We begin to see that his parents went to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. Verse 42 says, when he was 12 years old, his parents took him to Jerusalem. And when they had finished what they were doing, they began to pack and head off to go back home. The problem was Jesus decided he wasn't going with the family. He stayed there in the temple. And Joseph and Mary, they didn't know it. In fact, the Bible says the boy Jesus lingered behind. I love that. He lingered behind. What a perfect description also of the Holy Spirit who lingers with us. And that's what we've been experiencing the last several nights is the Holy Spirit just lingering. The the longer we wait on him, he just lingers with us. Well, the Bible says that Jesus, he lingered behind in Jerusalem. And his mother and father didn't know it. So much so that they had traveled a day's journey before they realized, where's Jesus? And I love the text that says they began to inquire among their friends, their associates, and their family. In other words, did he get on your camel? Is he in your tent? You can imagine at a rest stop, if you're traveling with your family, and maybe there are many different cars, and you got uncles and aunts, and it's a family reunion, and you're asking, did Junior go with you? Is he over there? And finally, everyone says, no, he's not here. And so they journeyed a day back, and they were literally searching throughout the whole city. And when they found him in the temple... Mary says something amazing. Son, why have you done this to us? Why would you scare us so bad? That's something typical that a parent would ask. Where have you been, Jesus? Why would you do it? Listen to his answer. Why did you seek me? Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? And the Bible says that they did not understand the statement in which he spoke. And the reason was Jesus' eyes were focused on the shorelines of heaven. In John 8, Jesus is speaking to the Jewish people. In verse 23, he turns to them and says, You are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. But they didn't understand him. In fact, if you actually look at the Greek to the Aramaic text, it says they were confused. And they began to talk amongst each other. And the reason they didn't understand is because Jesus' eyes were focused on the shorelines of heaven. 
In John 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus tells his disciples, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know the way you know. Well, Thomas stands up and he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And Lord, we don't understand what this all means. Again, not to be repetitive, but they did not understand because they couldn't see through the fog of the Roman occupation. Their eyes were completely held back. And that's why Jesus said when he rode into Jerusalem, if you on this day would have known what would bring you your peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. What he is saying is the culture and the Roman occupation and paying your bills and going to work and raising your kids and staying married and doing all the things of life here on earth has clouded your destination. Going to class and putting it away for your 401k. Trying to make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row. Well, you've, you've just been blinded to really what life is all about. You see, sometimes through the troubles of life, we too get focused on the fog. And it causes us to get discouraged. And we want to give up. But if you can keep your eyes on the shore, if you can realize where we are headed If you can look around and see the signs of the times, that's why these nights have been so important. Because the longer you linger, the more the fog begins to lift. How many say amen to that? And suddenly you begin to see clearly about where God is going and what is happening in your life. And there's a fresh anointing and a fresh healing and a fresh call of God. And the Bible says that we are to literally look for the signs of the times. Well, what are the signs of the times? Well, the Bible teaches the changes in the weather patterns, earthquakes in diverse places, wars and rumors of wars. Rumors of wars. You mean like when the crazy man in North Korea threatens to blow up a United States aircraft carrier? Could that be a rumor of war? You mean when they bomb Syria because they are gassing their people with searing gas? Could that be a rumor of war? You mean when... When Putin begins to send MiGs to fly just off the shoreline of Alaska and they're saber-rattling, could that be a rumor of war? You mean when the scientists begin to talk about global warming and there's changes in the weather patterns, could that be a sign of the times? Or ISIS? Or when people are lovers of themselves, bold People that literally are, can care less about anyone else. I was just reading in the office uh, on, my, on my phone that they have literally canceled Ann Coulter's me, uh, speech there in Berkeley. And whatever you think of Ann Coulter, it, that's not the case. The case is that these people are not going to allow another view to be spoken. And so they're going to riot and they're going to burn. Why? Because they're lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters proud, disobedient to Paris, parents. The Bible tells us in the last days, this is how it will be. And it's in these times that you literally have to keep your eyes focused on the shore lines of heaven. And if you can believe and see by faith what Abraham saw. Well, the Bible says Abraham saw a city whose builder and maker was God. If you can get into the altar and have those things lifted, well, then you can make it if you can see the shore. See, Jesus rode towards Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, fully aware of what was taking place and what was coming in the very near future. He knew that the shouts of, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or a better translation, Adonai, Adonai to the most high God. He knew that very soon it would turn to crucify him, crucify him. But his eyes were on the shorelines of heaven. He knew what was waiting for us, and the only way for us to get to heaven was for him to go to the cross, to rise again on that third day and die for our sins. And that's why on this Palm Sunday, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. They actually called it the day of lamb selection, the day that they would select their lamb that would cover them, each family, for a year of sins. 
so interesting, the story of Passover and the day of lamb selection. Did you know that every father in each house was responsible for choosing a lamb without spot or wrinkle? Did you know that after they chose that lamb, they would have to bring that lamb into the house and that lamb would live with the family for 10 days and they would treat that lamb as if it was a cherished pet. That lamb would sleep with the children. That lamb would eat at the table. And that lamb would bathe with the babies, and it would become a cherished member of the family. Now, listen, I, I don't know about you, and I don't know about your family, but if I brought a baby lamb when my kids were little into the house, let's take the lamb out for the illustration. If I brought in a cute little white puppy, a little Labrador puppy, and we treat him, my kids, there is no possible way I'd be able to get rid of that puppy. But if I knew in 10 days I would have to sacrifice that puppy, it would take on a whole new meaning. And those 10 days, that family loved that lamb, and God the Father was wanting them to get just a small little taste of how much he loved his perfect lamb. You see, there's so much more there than we can even possibly get into today. Oh, on the day of lamb selection, not only would a father choose the lamb, but the high priest would choose the lamb, and his lamb would be sacrificed for the sins of the nation. And he would go outside to a little sect of Jewish leaders or priests that would raise these little perfect lambs just outside of Nazareth in Bethlehem of Judea. And they would be brought up and he would choose that little lamb and he would walk that little lamb down the street up into the temple and that evening they would sacrifice it. Isn't it interesting that God sent his perfect lamb who rode down the streets and they shouted out to him the same way he went into the temple that evening but he saw that the time was not right, so he went away again to pray. Oh, there's so much more there. Friends, I believe that God is calling us to keep our eyes focused on the shorelines of heaven. And that is why Jesus is weeping on this Lamb Selection Day as he's coming into Jerusalem. I wonder how many today, even how many of you listening to me right now, I wonder how many of you are having difficulty really seeing through the fog of life. I wonder how many of you right now in your day's experience are really looking forward to actually going to heaven. I'm going to pause just for a second. I, I want that to sink in. And I want you to ask yourself. In fact, I want you to say it this way. I'll say my name, you say yours. And I want you to say, am I really looking forward to going to heaven? Let's do that together. I'll say mine, you say yours. And then say, am I really looking forward to going to heaven? Here we go. At the count of three. One, two, three. Randy, am I really looking forward to going to heaven? You see, a lot of times I think we think about heaven as being boring. As being one eternal church service that never ends. Where we sing hymn after hymn and song after song over and over and over again, forever and ever throughout eternity. I mean, hey, gang, let's be honest. I love to worship, and I love to sing, and I love to come to church, but there's got to be a little more to heaven than that. I mean, I love it, but there's got to be more than that. Listen, God made us, and when he made us, he didn't put a desire in us to eat gravel or to eat dirt. No, God put desires in us, and he doesn't change those desires midstream. He has a plan and a purpose. He has a hope and a future for all eternity. And it will include worship and giving God glory. And Jesus will be the center of our eternity. But I'm convinced there's so much more to heaven than we can possibly imagine or anything we have ever been taught. In fact, I want you to close your eyes right now, and I want you to imagine the most beautiful place you can imagine, the most beautiful place you've ever been to. Just kind of close your eyes. And I want you to imagine a place complete with palm trees and white sand beaches and raging rivers and jagged mountains. Now throw some waterfalls in there and crystal clear water and snow drifts above your head. Now with that imagination, with your eyes still closed, I want you to see friends and family. And I want you to put them in the picture with you. The ones who love Jesus. 
I want you to picture them in that beautiful place with you right now. Your sons, your daughters, your uncles, your aunts, your grandparents. In that beautiful place. All of you have powerful bodies because there's no cancer there. There's no arthritis there. You're laughing. You're, pray, you're playing. You're talking. You're reminiscing. You're loving one another. Now look this way. You got that mental picture? Then suddenly someone walks up behind you and taps you on the shoulder, and you turn and you look into the eyes of Jesus. And you find yourself kneeling before the master. And the first words out of his mouth are, come on, arise, get up. Welcome, my good and faithful servant. And he says, I want to show you what I have prepared for you. I've been waiting for you. I've prepared so much for you. Oh, I can't wait to show it to you. Listen, friend, that is the reality for every person that has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That is the reality that we have to look forward to. That one day, I'm going to look into the eyes of the perfect Lamb of God. Because I've had my day of lamb selection. I've selected my lamb. I've got to ask, have you selected your lamb? And I'm going to look in the eyes of Jesus. And I'm going to hear those words that I've been waiting for all my life. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Listen, friend, there'll be no sorrow or sickness there. There'll be no more death, no more tears, no more pain, no more crying. There's no muscle pain or Oh, heaven's going to be a wonderful place. The former things have passed away, and all of a sudden, all things have become new. There'll be no sin in heaven. You see, we live in a day and age where people don't believe about sin. No, we don't call sin, sin anymore. We say, Pastor, I made a mistake. We say, Dad, I made a blunder. We'll turn to our wife and say, well, honey, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. But the Bible says sin is what destroys. The Bible says sin is what separates. It separates man from God, husband from wife. It separates sons and daughters. Do you realize entire families fall apart, not because of a mistake, not but because of a blunder, but because of sin? And actually, we're living in a day and age right now where Americans don't want to talk about sin, and they don't want their pastors to talk about sin. They they don't want their pastors to preach about sin. No, they want their pastors to be bright and brotherly and breezy and loving, and they want to walk out of church feeling wonderful about myself. Oh, I can live like hell during the week, and I partied all night long on Saturday, but on Sunday I'm going to lift my hands, and pastor, don't say anything about it. Just make me feel good. We don't want to hear about sin. In fact, we actually pay little comedians millions of dollars to make jokes about people's sin and the things they do. And people spend $11, $12, $13 to buy a movie ticket to go watch about sin. Oh, that's not their husband. That's not their wife in that relationship on that screen. They're having a sexual affair on that screen. But it's just fantasy. It's just a movie. It's no big deal. And do you realize you're planting that seed deep within your spirit, and you're going to water that with the culture of the day. But when we get to heaven, there'll be no sin in heaven. We are now living in a nation swimming in an immoral sewer of adultery, sexually transmitted disease, rape, murder, drugs, divorce, pornography, and gangs. You say, oh, no, no, not, not gangs. We've taken care of that, Pastor Randy. Oh, really? I was just listening to the, uh, uh, the new attorney general, Jeff Sessions, and he was saying that now the United States is declaring war on MS-13, the biggest, largest international drug gang in the history of America. Because they're going around the nation and beheading people selling their drugs. This is the nation we are living in. That literally over 3,000 people have been murdered in the city of Chicago, Illinois alone since January. Over 3,000. And yet we sit in our churches and we say, oh, no, no, don't talk about that, pastor. 
Just be bright. Just be breezy. Just be brotherly. Just be loving. But when I get to heaven, in the not-too-distant future, the curse of sin is going to be broken. And we will live in a place where sin cannot enter. And the Bible calls that place the New Jerusalem. And you need to understand that the New Jerusalem is not heaven. It's the city within heaven. And Revelation tells us the dimensions of that city. It tells us the walls and the depth and the height and the breadth of that city. And if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and you know you're on your way to heaven, I want you to give me a shouting amen that you know and thank God that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you've got access to this new place. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, some people want to go to heaven because they think it's like Hawaii or maybe Hilton Head, you know. The weather is good. All their family is vacationing there, and I might get 18 holes of golf in. It might be great. But I want you to understand there's more to heaven than a great climate. At last, you'll be with the person for whom you were made. Oh, did you catch it? At last, you'll be in heaven, but at last you'll know the place, and at last you'll know the person for whom you were made. There was a movie that was put out several years ago that so many of these young ladies have been running after, Fifty Shades of Grey, and it talks about, it's really, it's a perverted movie, and the whole premise of the movie is this young man and young lady trying to find out if they each other are made for each other. And it seems like a whole culture is asking, are you made for me? Am I made for you? Oh, millions of dollars on date sites, on the, on the web. And listen, friend, when we get to heaven, you're going to find out that you were made for God. Well, you didn't hear me. You're going to find out that you were made for God. And you'll understand. And the Bible says you'll see loved ones that have gone ahead, those who have gone ahead in faith and gone ahead in death on this side of death, but they're in heaven waiting. My grandmother's going to be there, my grandfather, my Uncle Evans, and my Uncle Anthony, my cousin Nancy, my Uncle Angelo. My grandmother, Ramona, will be there. I spent a lot of time with my grandmother growing up, and she used to tell me, mijo, she said, say, baby, don't blow it. I'll be waiting by one of the 12 gates in the New Jerusalem. And whenever I messed up, I got a mental picture of my grandma standing by one of those gates in the New Jerusalem. For the Bible says in the city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, there are 12 gates, three to a side. And each tribe of Israel will enter through one of those gates. And my grandmother would say, Randy, I'm going to be waiting by one of those gates. And I would get a mental picture of grandma waiting right there. And her finger, don't blow it, I'm waiting. Do you have more people waiting on that side than this side? Then I want you to get a mental picture Because the Bible tells us one day there will be a reuniting of families just inside the eastern gate of the new Jerusalem. They'll be shouting. They'll be dancing. They'll be laughing. They'll be rejoicing. The Bible says it'll be joy unspeakable and full of glory. I can kind of feel it right now just talking about it. Oh, come on. If you believe that, somebody clap your hands and praise him for it. That's your destiny if you're a child of God. Just inside the eastern gate, I'm going to see relatives. I'm going to see friends for all of eternity. But the Bible says I'm also going to see Jesus. If you love the Lord and you're thankful that he rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday with his eyes focused on the shorelines of heaven, If you're thankful that he said yes in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he could have said no, but he said yes. If you're thankful that he took his blood-soaked face and he jerked it erect on that cross at Calvary, and he looked up to heaven and cried, it is finished. If you're thankful that on the third day they rolled a stone away and the Holy Spirit of God invaded the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and raised to life again the three-day dead body of the Lamb of God, and now he's sitting at the right hand 
hand of the Father. If you're thankful that he has sent the Holy Spirit as the mirror image of Jesus Christ, the Olos Paracletus, another of the same kind, if you're thankful that you're born again, if you're thankful that you're on your way to heaven, if you're thankful that you're covered with the blood, you need to clap your hands and give him praise that you are alive and well because of the power of the risen Savior. Come on, somebody praise him. Well, you didn't hear me. Praise him. I want you to praise him like you've never praised him before. Because eye has not seen nor ear has heard the wonderful blessing things that he has waiting for you and I. Somebody clap your hands and praise him. I praise you, Lord. The other day I read that in an Indiana cemetery, there's a tombstone that's over 100 years old. And on the tombstone, the inscription says, Paul, stranger, when you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. Well, an unknown person scratched these words on that same tombstone. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. (laughs) And that's so true. And that's really good advice. Because the Bible says you had better be careful in whom you are following. Well, I've got to say that again. The Bible says you had better be careful in whom you are following. Because Matthew 7 tells us not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I don't know who you are following today. I don't know if you're here visiting and maybe you're following Hare Krishna. Maybe you're following Buddha. Maybe you're following the New Age. Maybe you're following the Democrats or the Republicans or the Independents. I don't know if you think that it's all about doing good works. But as for me and my house, we will not follow Buddha. We will not follow Muhammad because they're still laying in the grave. We will not follow good works because I don't have enough good works to purchase my salvation from hell. No, my friend, I will follow the master. I will follow Jesus of Nazareth. He is alive. He is well. He's still the alpha and the omega and the beginning and the end. If you believe that, you need to assure yourself and encourage yourself in the Lord as you praise him. Yes. Can somebody just shout, thank you, Jesus? And the reason I ask you to do that, not to elicit a response, but if you were here the other night, I told you that a key to having prayer answered is not begging, but thanking God in advance for what he's already promised. I'm thankful for Jesus. I wouldn't have any hope if it wasn't for Jesus. The Bible teaches in Hebrews 11.10 that the new Jerusalem where we will live in heaven is a city. Now, we all know what cities look like. We understand what a city is. And friends, I believe that's a clue. God was giving us implications in his word. If you want to know what the new Jerusalem is like, then all you have to do is understand what a city really looks like. We all know a city has buildings and culture and food and Music and athletics and art and entertainment. It has goods and services and commerce. We all know that cities are busy. Last time I was here, pastor took me downtown to see the Greenville downtown area. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon in February. and People were out walking across that bridge. And it was a busy street. So we just had a great time. Well, the New Jerusalem has all those things. It's a thriving city. And if God didn't want us to think it that way, then he wouldn't have said it that way in the Bible. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. He wanted us to use our imagination. So what's the new Jerusalem like? I believe it's the most beautiful and gorgeous city you can ever imagine in your mind. Listen, Frank, can you imagine this present earth without rivers and mountains and trees? Can you imagine this present earth without the ocean? Or, Pastor, can you imagine this earth without Pebble Beach? No. Well, if you can't imagine this place without those things, then you shouldn't imagine heaven without those things. See, God doesn't promise us a non-earth. He promises us a new earth. 
So take everything and anything you see here, minus all the negatives, then magnify it by 10 million times. By the greatest creator, God Almighty. Then you can begin to get some sense of what the eternal heaven is really going to be like. The Bible tells us we will have resurrected bodies. Oh, I like that. Resurrected bodies. Listen, gang, you have never seen through eyes that were not under the curse of sin. You've never heard music through ears that were not dulled by the curse of sin. You have never tasted food that has not been dulled by the curse of sin. But can you imagine when the curse of sin is broken and we have a glorified body? The Bible says you're going to have the perfect shape. Now, I don't know what that is, but we're going to have a perfect shape. If you want to have the perfect shape, then you need to get saved and go to heaven. (laughs) If you want to look better, you got to go to heaven. Because I promise you, when you get there, you're going to look better. Listen, we will know each other. I'll know you. You'll know me. We'll recognize each other. We're not going to be some folded spirit bouncing around like an atom or a neutron like Shirley MacLaine says. No, 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 no. Shirley MacLaine says we're going to be reduced to atoms. Oprah Winfrey says we're just going to be little folded spirits bumping around. I say you're both idiots. I know that's not politically correct. But why be politically correct when you can be right? Amen? No, the Bible says you will have a body. And everything we can do with this body, I want you to imagine that. But the Bible says you're going to get an upgrade when you get to heaven. Kind of like when you go to AT&T and they let you know you're due for an upgrade. And they say you can get, you can turn in your old phone and you can get a new one. You get an upgrade. It's still a phone. It just has added features. (laughs) How many like added features, right? And the Bible says we're going to have added features. We get an upgrade. Turn to the person next to you, smile and say, your body's due for an upgrade. I I love you. You should see the elbows flying now. I love you, honey, but your body's due for an upgrade. See, we try to upgrade this body here on earth as much as we can. We try to buffet it. We try to paint it. If we're bald, we try to spray hair on it. And Yeah, we go to Jenny Craig and try to get it all the weight off. But when we get to heaven, we're going to get an upgrade. The Bible calls it the perfect shape. I don't know what that's going to be, but I can't wait till we get to heaven. I'm going to get an upgrade. It's not, like, you know, it's not like when you sing a new song, that song doesn't have rhythm and rhyme and lyrics. A song is a song, a phone is a phone, a, a car is a car, a body is a body, but in heaven you get a glorified body. We're going to get an upgrade. Now my imagination goes wild when I talk about heaven. There have been times I've laid in bed and couldn't sleep because my mind was going 100 miles an hour and I'm thinking about, I wonder what heaven's like. And the reason I do that is because for 28 years, I've been inviting people to go to heaven with me. Wouldn't it be good? I I must look crazy to a lot of people because they're saying, you're talking about a man you've never seen with your eyes. And I'll smile at them and say, well, you believe in the wind and you've never seen that. Well, I feel it and I feel him. Has anybody else felt him? And if you've been here every night, you have felt him. Oh, it's been amazing, and tonight's going to be no different. But my imagination goes wild. Maybe we'll be able to scuba dive in heaven without a mask or an air tank. Wouldn't that be cool? Maybe we'll be able to fly like an eagle. Maybe we'll be able to run like a cheetah. I don't know. See, some of you are so boring. Some of you... Some of, you think when I, some of you think when you get to heaven, you're going to sit there just with a little, you know, harp. Bling, bling, bling. Well, you can do that, I guess, if you want. But when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a glorified body. Hallelujah. And, and I'm going to do things that I was limited to doing on this side of the earth. And every time I do something in heaven that I couldn't do here because I didn't have a glorified body, I'm going to thank the Lord. And I'm going to say, thank you, God, that I got an upgrade. Thank you, Lord, that you said yes. I'm going to shout hallelujah. I believe heaven is the final frontier. 
That saying was not stole by Star Trek. That comes from the Bible. Heaven, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Some of you are slow, but you're really worth waiting for, I tell you. Jesus is the source of everything fascinating. Well, you didn't hear me. Jesus is the source of everything fascinating. I heard a young man tell me, well, you know, Brother Randy, I don't know. I mean, when we get to heaven, will they have classical music? I said, well, they have classical music. He goes, yeah, I was just wondering, will classical music be in heaven? Because he said, I love classical music. I said, do I need to remind you that God made Bach? God made Beethoven? He made science. He made it all. And, yes, I believe those things will be there And Jesus will be the center of that place called heaven. Listen, gang, there'll be nothing boring about heaven. And I believe our view of worship will change as well. Because we'll see Jesus is in everything. One night laying in bed, I thought, you know, I bet there'll be praise prompters in heaven. Anybody know what a praise prompter is? Well, this is my mind, so you have no possible way of knowing that. If you could read my mind, we'd be in trouble. But I believe praise prompters will be all over heaven. Here's a praise prompter in my imagination. As you're walking through heaven down the New Jerusalem, you're cruising down 101 Hallelujah Boulevard in the New Jerusalem, and you're hanging out with Samson and Gabriel, and you're talking to the angel Gabriel, and, and all of a sudden you come across something you've never seen before, and you turn to Gabriel and say, hey, Gabe, have you ever seen that? And Gabriel said, I've never seen it, Randy, and I've been here a long time. That I want you to praise God like you've never praised him before because the Bible says he's a creative, miracle-working God, and he will continue to create all through the time of heaven. And you'll see something in heaven that will so blow you away that you'll just want to lift your hands and give him praise. And that's where the Bible says, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Praises to my king. And just as he's preparing a place for us. Just as he's preparing a place for us. He is also preparing us for that place. And I had to catch myself because he prepares us for that place through trials and tribulation, through difficulties, in hopes that you would turn to him and not to Freud or Dr. Phil. He's preparing a place for us. You can make it through the fog of life. Did you know the Holy Spirit is interceding right now on your behalf? In fact, the Bible says he's interceding for you as individuals. He's encouraging us. And the Holy Spirit is listening to your voice, and he hears you call at night. And if you'll listen back, you'll hear him many times in your home say things like, keep going, don't give up, keep running the race, don't walk away from me now. The Holy Spirit is saying, I promise you one of these days, you're going to hear Jesus say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. You can keep praying a little more. You can tithe a little better. You can give a little more. Don't turn your back on things now. I know the fog is thick right now. I know that the times are difficult, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Don't turn your back now. If you will turn your ear at night to hear the whispers of God. Revelation 7 says, before the throne of God, they will serve him day and night. What that means is your dream project awaits you in the next world. Isn't that cool? Your dream project. That came to me one day when I was running at Evangel University. I I work out there at the Maybe Center, the Student Center, and there was one of the professors walking around the track, and I saw him wiping his face. At first, I thought he was sweating, but the coach that was running next to me on the treadmill said, no, bro, what he's doing is... Is he's praying because his wife was giving me a great, I don't remember the number, 30 years or so, 40, 50 years, has passed away. And so I got off the treadmill, and I went and I started walking, and I caught up with him, and we got to talking. And I said, how are you? And he said, I'm fine. We got to talking. He said, you know, I got so caught up in raising kids and getting my Ph.D. and making sure I could pay the bills, 
I had so many dream projects that I never got to. I got to ask you, does anyone here have dreams that you've never attained or never got to? Can I see your hand? Yeah. Oh, don't be ashamed. Kind of lift them up there. And what happens is, there's an old saying, life happens. And he looked at me and he said, you know, that's my only regret, Randy, is that I didn't get to all the projects and the dream projects I had. And the Holy Spirit inspired me to tell him, but guess what? Revelation 7 says that before the throne of God, we'll serve him day and night. I believe your dream project is waiting in heaven. And you'll have all eternity to work out the details. And he got this huge smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye. And he wiped his face. He goes, yeah, my spirit bears witness with that. And you could see that he got a step up and picked up his step a little bit. Because when you realize that this place is not my home, my tents are pitched on enemy territory. This is not flower beds of ease. I'm on my way to the new Jerusalem, and my God tells me in Scripture that this life is like the puff of a steam kettle. As the dry grass burns up in the noonday sun, so our life begins to go by. But in heaven, oh, Lord, in heaven, my dream Projects wait. We won't get to heaven and just float around and do nothing. I know that's what the world thinks. The world thinks we're going to get these big old white wings and we're going to sit around in white robes and float on a cloud. Duh. No, the Bible says we will serve him. In the Bible, we see a foretaste of a glimpse of what eternal heaven will be like. The Bible tells us that there is something called the marriage supplica of the Lamb. There's a banquet feast. So that means we will enjoy food. Come on. I love it. We're going to enjoy reunions. We will enjoy each other. Listen, if you enjoy seeing the Grand Canyon or the Alps, if you enjoy travel now, if you enjoy seeing the Amazon forest, the African Serengeti, and think it's beautiful now, imagine how beautiful it really is where the curse of sin is lifted and you don't have to look through the fog of sin and the fog of this life, but you see it in the way, ultra technicolor, and the way that the master created it to be. Can you imagine how beautiful it's going to be then? Imagine when the curse of sin is no longer there. Imagine the sensory delight. Imagine the breathtaking beauty. Oh, how beautiful the other side of heaven must be. And we'll be living in a city bustling with activity. Listen, today I'm just trying to get you to get a glimpse of what heaven will really be like. The Bible tells us that the new Jerusalem is described as being 1,500 miles square by 1,500 miles square by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. The walls are 200 feet thick. There are 12 gates, three to a side. The Bible tells us that the walls are 6,000 stories high. Now, if each story is 12 feet, can you imagine an awesome city? Philippians 3 tells us our citizenship is in heaven. Revelation talks about the visual magnificence of the architecture of the new Jerusalem when it says there are 12 stone foundations, one on top of the other. And the high priest had 12 stones on his breastplate. And it's the exact same stones that the foundation of the new Jerusalem and that city were built upon. And the reason is he wanted to give them a foretaste so that when we are actually in heaven, standing on those stones in the new Jerusalem, we can think of the high priest and how he could only go one day out of the year into the presence of God. But look now, because Jesus rode into the earthly Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, because Jesus said yes in the Garden of Gethsemane, because Jesus went to the cross at Mount Calvary, and he spilled his blood for you and me, because Jesus rose again on the third day, we can now don't just don't carry those stones on our blessed prey, We stand there as a victorious church upon the foundation of the risen Savior. And the Bible tells us that's the reality that's coming very, very soon. The Bible tells us in heaven there's a tree of life. Oh, now, don't don't miss it. I'm going to try to wrap this up for you. And that tree of life will produce a fruit every month. And that fruit is not to be admired, is to be eaten, and it will give eternal life. In John chapter 21, 
It describes mountains that are great and high, so there are mountains in heaven. There'll be, no time, there'll be time in heaven, contrary to what people think. There'll be racial differences in heaven. Hear what I just said. There'll be racial differences in heaven. So listen, if you're Puerto Rican now, you're going to be Puerto Rican in heaven. <laughs> if you're white now, sorry, you're going to be white in heaven. If you're black now, you're going to be black in heaven. You say, well, how in the world would you think that? The Bible says every kindred, every tongue, every race. We're not all going to turn white and wear white robes. How vanilla is that? God likes flavor. God likes arroz con pollo and pateles and rice and beans. God loves it all. (laughs) There's no calories in heaven. Amen? That means you can eat whatever you want. There'll be no Jenny Craig in heaven. The Bible talks about food in heaven. Actually, over a thousand times in Scripture, it mentions meals. That means we're going to have a lot of feasts in heaven. The word feast in the Bible is mentioned 187 times. Now, Christians, you should love that. Because we Christians, we love to partake. You know, we, we love to go out and we call it fellowship. Chow down, right? We'll have more pleasure in heaven, not less. So there'll be relationships in heaven. There'll be no loneliness in heaven. In fact, I believe there'll be dinosaurs in heaven. That kind of just struck me just now. Yeah. When I get to heaven in my glorified body, I want to I, I ride a, t- a Tyrannosaurus Rex. I really do. You know, those ones with the little arms like this? Wouldn't that be cool? I do know for a fact there'll be no cats in heaven. <laughs> Only dogs. No cats. I got to share this story with you because I get to leave tomorrow. But... <laughs> Pastor convinced me that I had to get a certain kind of dog years ago. How many years ago was that? Many, many years ago. And so he told me this breed, you know, the little tiny foo-foo dogs, little fluffy dogs that, you know, and he said it's the greatest breed in the world. you got to get this dog. And then Martin and Sharon piped in, oh, yes, we got one, and it's so wonderful. And, and so I went home, and I gave in, and I got my daughter the same foo-foo dog. Problem was I had one that was brain dead. (laughs) That dog didn't like me. That dog didn't care for me. And I would take her outside to go to the bathroom. True story. In the the middle of winter in Springfield, Missouri, and I'd be standing out there. And so pastor told me, he said, but you know, you have to talk to them sweet. (laughs) So I'm talking to the, come on, baby, go poop, 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 (laughs) poop. She just looked at me. I'm freezing. It's like 32 degrees. I'm like, come on, baby, peep, 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 peep. Talking sweet. No sooner do I bring that dog in the house, she will run to my side of the bed and do it right there on the floor. That's a true story. Go around the other side, jump up on my wife's bed, and just go to sleep. I hated that dog. That was a demon dog. So that dog won't be in heaven. (laughs) And there'll be no cats in heaven. Cats are worthless. Can't cheat a cat to do anything. They don't bring you your slippers. They don't bring you the newspaper. They just have an attitude, right? Cats just look at you like, are you kidding me? Really? But the reality is there will be, there'll be large cats in heaven. For the Bible says that the lion shall lay down with the lamb. The lion shall lay down with the lamb. That's awesome. One of these days, gang. What's heaven going to be look like? Listen as I try to close. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24, it says, it gives us a description of our very first day in heaven. When I was growing up, they used to sing an old southern gospel song. Well, it's a great, great morning, your first day in heaven when you stroll down the golden avenue. There'll be mansions left and wide and you'll thrill at every sight. And the saints will all be smiling saying, how do you do? Oh, it's a great, great morning. I just dated myself. 
But have you ever thought about the first day of heaven? When you're at a celebration service for a, or a home going, have you ever stopped to think what your loved one was experiencing the very first day they went to heaven? Now, our minds, we really can't grasp that, but Hebrews 12, 22 through 24 explains it. Did you know that the Bible actually talks about your first day in heaven? Let's read it. Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. So right away, we are told that we've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, and there'll be so many angels there, you won't be able to count it. That'll be the first thing that'll catch your eye, just the magnificence of the walls and You look around, there'll be so many angels. The Bible says we'll be standing on streets of gold, angels all around. You're going to recognize so many different things and so many different people. And the Bible then tells us Jesus will be standing there. Verse 23, it says, To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Let me break that down in layman's terms. The general assembly is the entire multitude. That means when God gathers all of us together. And the church of the firstborn. He's talking about the firstborn, of course, would be Jesus himself or Adam, the first Adam. But the church of the firstborn, don't miss this, who are registered in heaven. Now, here's the key. They are registered in heaven. On Saturday, when I checked into the hotel, I walked in, and they said, hello, sir. And I said, hello. And they said, do you have a reservation? In other words, they're asking, are you registered here? And I said, oh, yes. The church made the reservation, and I gave them my name. And the next word, she said, do you have any ID? Do you have anything that can identify you? I said, sure, and I showed her. She went on the computer, and she goes, oh, I got it right here. She looked up and smiled, and she said, welcome. You see, that's what's going to happen on your first day in heaven. The Bible calls it the Lamb's Book of Life, and it shall be opened up, and you'll be asked, are you registered in heaven? Has your name been written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you have anything to identify that you are supposed to be here? And if you're a child of God and you've given your life to Christ and your name has been written in that, what has identified you as a child of God is you're covered with the crimson blood that flows from Mount Calvary's tree. The precious blood of Jesus that covers you and that covers your sin. And by grace, you are saved through faith. It goes on to say in verse 23, Registered in heaven to God, the judge of all. So you're registered in heaven to God. In other words, I'm registered in his name. He's the judge of all. To the spirits of just men made perfect. Look at verse 24. And then you will see Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Oh, I hope you caught that. A mediator is the one that comes between the two. When there's an argument, when there's a legal discourse or a legal case... You go and get a mediator. Jesus is the mediator between what I deserve and what grace covers. He is the mediator of my eternity. He's my kinsman redeemer. And he's the mediator of the new covenant. He is the fulfillment of the law. And then it says, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things. Oh, hold on now. We have sung about it. I've preached about it. But one day I'm going to walk to the altars of grace and I'm going to see the precious blood of Jesus that has been sprinkled there to cover my sin. Did you know you're actually going to see the blood 
of Jesus and look up in his eyes and you'll be able to look into the eyes of the master and Revelation says you'll see him face to face. And the Bible teaches that when we are in heaven, we will see him face to face and we will look at him unashamed. Think about that. Unashamed. The Bible said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you evil-minded. In other words, you will draw into him without any shame, knowing you're being covered, not looking down with guilt and condemnation, but standing in the presence with adoration and with praise. Why is, why is that so important? Because he's covered you. You're an heir to the throne. I want the musicians just to come quickly. Where are you going to spend eternity? And the reason I waited till tonight to do this is because I wanted to build one upon the other. And last night I asked you, are you even open to the possibility of God taking you down a road that you've never been? Are you even open to a possibility of God using you in a way you've never been used? Are you even open to the possibility that God wants to anoint you and use you to intercede for the lost? And I told you, that Ruth met her kinsman redeemer in the field because God is concerned about the harvest. And if you've lost your hunger for the harvest, well, then you've, you've lost the heart of God. I don't want to lose the heart of God. So I continually every morning wake up and say, Randy, encourage yourself in the Lord, just like David did. How many this week have been encouraging yourself in the Lord? Come on. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. I'm not going to speak negative. I want to water seeds that God has planted in me with faith and with praise. Lord, I don't, I don't want to speak death. I want to speak life. I want to reap a harvest, so I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. I'm going to turn my doubts to praise. But, Lord, I want to get out into the harvest field as well. See, listen, gang, you have something over us preachers. You know what that is? You go to the harvest field every day. Oh, did you catch it? You go to the harvest field every day. You will see people and meet people that I'll never have the privilege of. You will, I'm like the coach. I don't get on the field. But you get on the field. And you have loved ones and friends and family that I'll never meet, that you will meet on a holiday or a birthday. And God has placed you there so that you can be the voice like Naomi was to Ruth. I got to ask you, gang, how concerned are you about bringing people to heaven? Let me tie this together and bring this home. Because I want to bring as many as I can with me. I want to know, since, since I know now that I'm going to recognize people, I want to be able to recognize a whole lot of people. Anybody else feel the same way? I want to be able to see my sons, and my daughter. I don't want to leave any family behind. There's an old story about a missionary coming home from the mission field, exhausted, tired, weary. Got off the airplane after 24 hours of traveling around half the world, landed in his hometown, came off the plane and walked into the terminal. And there was a large crowd there shouting and with balloons and signs. Turns out they weren't there for him but they were there for a television star that was visiting. And his wife was parking the car and she was gonna meet him on the, at the terminal exit there, baggage claim. And as he walked through that crowd, he kind of got a little discouraged and he said, you know, Lord, it's not fair. I've been doing all this for you. 
traveling around the world, and there's no one here to meet me. He kind of got down on himself, waited in baggage claim all alone, and went out to the car, put his cars in the trunk, stuff in the trunk, and got in the car and kissed his wife, and they got home, and she said, what's wrong? You, I only saw you a couple days ago. I got home first, but what's wrong? He goes, well, I'm kind of down. There was nobody there to meet me at the airport. And she said, no, no, I know. I, I'm sorry. I was busy. He goes, no, not you. But where was all our family? Where was all our friends? There, there should have been somebody there. And he said, but there was a crowd there for a, a television star. And that wife turned and looked at her, him and said, honey, we're not home yet. We're not home yet. And she looked at him and she said, that's why we've been working so hard to make sure that when we get home, there's somebody there to greet us. I got to ask you, in your mind's eye right now, who's going to be there to greet you? I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor was so right. A spirit of intercession is about to hit this room. And I want you right now to begin to fill your, fill your heart with praise. We've laughed a little. and But the raw reality is that it's not a funny thing that there are many who will not make it to heaven. And I've got to ask this church, have you lost your vision for heaven? Is it easier to send a check to the mission field and not worry about your neighbor next door? And God is calling us. He wants to fill this place with praise. He he wants you to worship him. He wants your life to be a living sacrifice. I'm going to ask you right now just to stand and lift your hands and begin to worship the creator and get your eyes focused on the shorelines of heaven right now, just all over the room. With your hands lifted, just say, Lord, that I would focus my eyes on the shorelines of heaven. Some of you are dealing with the fog of life. You're dealing with the fog that is hindering you and I want you right now just to say Lord I I just want that fog to lift I want you to lead us in a song right just lead us in a